interesting going back the last you know several chapters actually we were following the story of of um, Saul chasing David and um, and then it seemed like uh, perhaps Saul was uh, repentant you know and and uh, had a had a, a change of heart towards David and and um, so and and then also in the midst of that we see God's sovereign hand upon the whole situation and guarding over and protecting David. And um, it's just interesting to see that, how God just is sovereignly directing David's path. But in that, he's also sovereignly directing his foes in protecting him. And so we saw a couple examples of that last week. The, the one I thought was actually kind of funny was that God actually sovereignly directed Saul to have to use the facilities at a particular time to relieve himself. And in the process of that, he was actually protecting David. And remember that, and David was able to sneak up behind him and cut a corner of his robe. And, um, and then later on, he uses that to demonstrate to Saul that he could have taken his life if he wanted to, but he didn't. He chose to not as David does not have it in his heart to, uh, to take out Saul because he sees him as God's anointed, and he was. He was God's anointed as the king. And so then we read on how we see how, how David has such a heart towards Saul in, in not taking his life. He's, he's merciful, he's gracious. But then we turn the corner and we see this guy, Nabal, and um, he's, he's unwilling to be to extend any generosity towards David and his troops. And, and in, in light of that, David absolutely goes ballistic and kind of slips into the flesh. And then we see how God, again, sovereignly intervenes and brings forth Nabal's wife, Abigail. And Abigail was described as beautiful and intelligent, and she is able to stand in the gap between Nabal, her husband, and David, and calm David down, and um, so he didn't take him out. But in the end, the Lord took him out. And, and then Abigail became David's wife. And so that is kind of a synopsis of what we covered last week real quick. So now we pick it up in chapter 26. It says, Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gabeus, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakalah? You know what? Before we get into that, actually... I Sorry, Jennifer, I had this on the PowerPoint, and I forgot to say something about it, but there's, there's a graphic I want to show. If you could pull up on the, the PowerPoint, I think it's the uh, 1 Samuel 11. It was, it was up there already. I don't know if it's still up there or not. Or is it still up there? All right. So, all right, that's the map. If you could back up, I think, one slide. Um, there's, I think this is really interesting. There you go percent of the Old Testament found in the New Testament. A lot of times, you know, there's churches, they never study the Old Testament. And, and, and many of them never study the Old Testament because they don't think it's relevant to their lives today, which is foolishness. But as we look at this, you take a look at the statistics there, I can barely read them with, from here, but um, the, the percentage of the New Testament books that contain Old Testament passages is quite interesting. So in studying the New Testament, in looking at this, it becomes very obvious that in order to really understand the New Testament, you have to have a pretty good running understanding of the Old Testament. And so those that choose to not study the Old Testament are actually cutting themselves short in understanding the depth and the breadth of what's actually being communicated in the New Testament. Revelation is by far the book that has the most Old Testament references in it. And so I just say that because... It's a reminder to, as to why we do this, why we're going through the Old Testament. And so it gives us a better, better understanding. Now, if you're having a hard time reading that and you want a copy of that, let me know. I'll send it to you. It's very interesting. So, all right. So now, actually, you could pull up that, that next map there because as, as we go through the text here, um, you'll see some of the areas in which David is going. And last, last week we left off at when he was at En Gedi, and that was on the west side of the, the Dead Sea. And it was kind of um, a, a bit of an oasis in that, in that particular area where there were springs and there was, there was life. 
and, and David was hiding out in those caves, and Saul and his men were hiding out in those caves, and, and so that's where we left off last week from a geographical standpoint. But now, again, in chapter 26, it says, Now the Ziphites came to Saul, and Kabiah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakalah, op opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. So notice again, someone has dimed David out and gone to Saul to let him know where he is. And so though David was very popular in Israel, there were still those that were undermining him, you know, diming out where he was. And so, you know, I think about that sometimes. We, you know, as believers, this, this whole story here uh, serves as a bit of an allegorical tale in a sense of, of the, the Christian life and being hunted down and chased down by the enemy. You know, we're, we can't fall asleep in this. We have got to be alert and ready because the enemy's not taking a nap. He's not taking a break. He's constantly on our tail. And, um, you know, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the wiles of the, of the, the enemy, of the devil, the wiles. The, in the Greek, it's basically, it means the methods. He has a strategy, and he's marked every one of you. If you're, if you're a, a believer, you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, Satan has a file on you. He's got a file. He knows everything about you. He remembers more stuff than you remember about yourself. He's got that file, and he's developed a strategy to go after every one of you. And so there may be times when it feels like everything's going just smooth. That's probably one that we're the most vulnerable, because that's when we start to let our guard down. We're in a battle, and it's not stopping. You know, think about the people that are over in, in Ukraine. And, you know, we go to bed at night. We don't have to worry about bombs bursting over the top of our homes. You know, or the potential of that happening necessarily, at least not here in Lancaster County. So um, over in Chester County, I don't know, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, we go to bed at night in relative peace. And, um, but they are not now. Those that have remained. And, you know, it's the same in Israel, in sections of Israel, where they're constantly being bombarded, you know, from these Palestinian territories they're lobbing bombs over all the time. We don't hear about it on the news because there is a, a bias against Israel. And so, but they're, they're constantly, certain sections of Israel const, constantly having to deal with bombs being lobbed over. Now, so they have to have people watching, watchmen. Well, we as believers, we're targets of the enemy. We have to be on watch. We have to be alert. We have to be ready. Not paranoid, but ready. And so with that, you know, I was just thinking about what, that with this. David is constantly being chased, harassed. And so he's got his guys. He sends his spies out to know what's going on. But Saul's got these people that are, you know, they're undermine, undermining David and reporting to him, his little minions, you know, and Satan's got his minions that are spying us out as well. You know, Satan's not omnipresent like God. So he's got his demonic realm and they... And they cruise around and they harass and and uh, and but sometimes they just lie in wait, you know, like an ambush. And so you're just cruising along, everything's hunky dory, everything's going smooth, and like that, you can get knocked off if you're not ready. So we need to be ready at all times. We need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need to have our eyes in the Lord. And the thing we need to remember that in that is greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So we have the power. You know, we have the power of the Lord uh, behind us. But that being said, we have to be alert and on guard. When we, after we finish Ephesians, I mean uh, Galatians, uh, we're going to spend a week. I'm going to go do a little bit of a, a, a prophetic update kind of thing. Uh, with regard to what's going on in the world right now, and then we're jumping into Ephesians. And when we get into Ephesians chapter 6, you know, we'll get into this in a little bit more in, uh, in depth. So, you know, with, also with that in mind, <laughs> we need to be praying. You know, I, I really just have a sense that God is reminding of this, this right now. 
we we are a target as a church and um we we cannot allow ourselves to get into a lull of comfort and complacency and indifference we have to take the attack to the enemy not wait for us to be attacked you know go on the offensive and the way in which we go on the offensive is through prayer one of the things i'm really excited about is this prayer ministry that's developing in the church because i think it's absolutely essential it's too bad we waited like seven years to do it you know almost but um hey better late than never right so we're gonna we're going on the attack in prayer that god would do a mighty work in our midst so so again verse three and saul encamped in the hill of hakalah which is opposite jeshimon by the road but david stayed in the wilderness and he saw that saul came after him into the wilderness david therefore sent out spies and understood that saul had indeed come so david arose and came to the place where saul had encamped and david saw the place where saul lay and abner the son of ner the commander of his army now saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him then David answered and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? Now remember, Saul has 3,000 men. David has 600 men. Now here's another thing to think about. David could have, he could have called forth a couple guys, Hey, why don't you go down there and do whatever it is I want you to do, right? So, but no, he goes down himself with Abishai, who is actually, um, where am I here? No, Abishai, yeah, the uh, son of Zeruah, brother of Joab. This is his, his nephew. And so, so there's a, a blood relationship there. There's a connection. Um, the other thing to remember here is Ahimelech, the Hittite, this would, he, he would not have been an, uh, is, an Israeli, he would have been uh, someone from outside of Israel, but he was most likely a mercenary soldier, you know, working for Saul, which is interesting. So, so David, uh, he is, and uh, Abishai, they're going to go down to Saul in the camp, and Abishai said, I will go down with you. So again, two guys, there's 3,000 guys there down there. Uh, both David and Abishai are very, very brave. But their bravery and their courage does not come from themselves. I believe it, com it comes from the Lord. I, I, God instills that in them, knowing that he is behind them. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, and his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please... Let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. So this is, remember the last time his, his friends were telling him to do the same thing. Ah, oh, we're hearing from the Lord. You should, you should take him out right here. And, and that seemed like the practical thing to do. And as I mentioned before last time, if I was standing there with David, I'd be like, yeah, take him out now, you know? Just seems like the common sense thing to do. But David was, was tuned in to the Lord and what the Lord wanted him to do. And, and so we can't always relegate the pragmatic or what seems to be the sensical thing to do as the right thing to do. We need to go before the Lord and ask the Lord what he would have us do. And so in this situation here, uh, David is he's convicted that he's not to go about uh, taking the life of Saul. Again, Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. His day shall come to die... Or, she, or he shall go out to battle and perish. So there's, David's convinced that God will carry it out. It's just a matter of how and when. And so he gives three different options here. The Lord shall strike him, his day shall come to die, or he shall go to battle and perish. As we read on, hate to be a spoiler, but as we read on, we will find that he will go out to battle and perish. 
And so we'll, I don't think we're getting that to that far this week, though. Um, all right, so the Lord, verse 11, forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head and they got away and no man saw or knew it or awoke for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. So here we see God's intervening again, supernaturally. He calls them to fall into such a deep sleep because there's no way they'd be able to sneak into that camp and just with, you know, human strength without God intervening and doing something. And so God put them into a deep sleep. You know, a deep sleep is a good thing. <laughs> I was just thinking about this. And, uh, you know, I thought I was real studying this today, and I was thinking, you know, I'm going to pray tonight that God will give me a deep sleep. Because there's, yeah, wouldn't you all like to have a deep sleep? So then you wake up in the morning, and you're refreshed, you're ready to go, th you know, through a new day. So God can do it. It says it right here. Even the enemies of the Lord, he can give a deep sleep to. So if we can ask, Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. If you want a good deep sleep, ask the Lord. So now David went over to the other side, stood on top of the hill afar off, a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, who are you calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord, the king. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is in the jug of water that was by his head. Very interesting. This is rem reminiscent of, you know, the previous story where David cuts off the corner of his robe. He's got that to show him, hey, check this out. I was right behind you. When you were relieving yourself, I was there. <laughs> Not a good place to be, probably. But anyway, so I um, <laughs> just thought of that right now. But he had it as proof that he could have taken him out. If David wanted to kill him, he could have, and now he has proof again. Now, this is interesting. The spear in that culture, as a king, would have been symbolic of, of the right to rule. So when David taking his spear, he was showing him he's taken. God's taken his right to rule, and he's given it to David. And then all the, the jug of water, the water representing sustenance, he also has the right, if he wants to, he could take his life. He had the ability and the right to do it, but he has not. And so in that, we can see. Now, remember also, back in that culture, when the kingship would change hands, it was the norm for the new regime coming in to take the lives of those that preceded them. But David and Saul had a covenant that they agreed upon that he would not do that. So then... Verse 17, then Saul knew David's voice and he said, is that your voice, my son David? David said, it is my voice, O my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my Lord, the king, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. So in this, we see David, he's saying, if there's any sin in me, you know, if there's any sin in me, I, I understand. Maybe perhaps God has, has raised you up to judge me. So if that's the case, let's go before the Lord with an offering. I love that because David is putting his heart out there before the Lord, you know, to examine, examining his heart, something that we should all do. You know, we should always be examining our hearts before the Lord. You know, as we get into uh, Galatians chapter 6 on Sunday, Paul reminds us to do that, examine our hearts. And so not to become complacent, not to become indifferent, not to be just going along, going through the motions of our, of our Christian life, not to be swayed by the culture. And I just, I just read a, uh, another disappointing story about uh, 
uh, Christian band, Ren Collective. Uh, anybody heard of them? A couple. All right. Well, they the uh, what's the guy's name? Is it Chris? I can't remember how to pronounce his last name. Well, he made a statement with regard to the, I guess it was kind of in regard to the, the transgendered swimmer and, uh, you know, in, in the collegiate ranks and, and that he was saying anyone who would not refer to that, it's a man, identifying as a woman, but he was saying that anybody that, w that wouldn't refer to that individual as a woman, his choice, was in the wrong. That's very disappointing to me. And that is, that's an example of cultural Christianity. Because cultural Christianity will not go back to the text to test things. It gets pulled and swayed and pull, uh, by the, the tide of the culture. And when the culture changes, cultural Christians change. You watch. You watch some of these people. You know, ones that are, that, well, I'm sure there's plenty of them out there that we don't know, but we, we hear the stories of the, the well-known, the famous, the celebrity preachers and musicians, and if they're cultural Christians, they will become swayed by the culture. So I love the uh, guy John Cooper. He's, um, it's the band he's from? Skillet. Skillet, thanks. He's being very vocal these days against that, that shift in cultural Christianity. He's standing in the gap, and I have tremendous amount of, of respect for him. He's getting mocked and ridiculed, too, by others that identify as Christians. You know, and they have their podcasts and their different, you know, articles that they write, and, and they're mocking him. But he's standing strong. He's uh, standing in the gap, and I have the utmost respect for that. So if you ever get a chance to listen to his podcast, it's really good. I would highly recommend it. So, but again, that's an example of we don't want to be cultural Christians. We want to be biblical Christians. And when the culture changes, we don't test what we believe in light of the culture. That's subjective. That changes. That's according to people's whims and feelings and thoughts that they have that they muster up. No, we don't test it in, front, in light of that. We test everything in light of God's holy, objective standard of truth, the Word of God. And God does not change, as it says in James, He does not change like shifting shadow. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And, so, you know, and that is comforting to me because it's a God that we can count on and we can lean on. We're not like, hey, Lord, do you still believe in this? No, we know because we look to God's word what he is about. And so David, he's, he's putting it out there. Um, is, if there's anything in my heart that's not right, I, I'm, you know, he's basically saying, hey, let's, let's go before the Lord with an offering. But it says, but if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea. And when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Now this is interesting. <coughs> a partridge in that day, if people were hunting... A partridge, a hunter's chasing after a partridge, the partridge for some reasons would not fly away. They would run away. And so, and apparently there were many of them. So you wouldn't, so the partridge, maybe if it, the one got away and ran into the woods or the trees or, the, or up into the mountains, um, you let it go because there were plenty of others to go after. So that kind of gives you a little bit of clarity here as to what David's communicating. Why would you do this? Why would you hunt after me like this? It makes absolutely no sense. So then Saul said, I have sinned. Now, now, remember not that long ago, Saul said, I have sinned, right? He had remorse. Something to think about as we read this is the di distinction between remorse and repentance. And we can talk about that a little bit after our time together. But there's a difference. There's a difference between remorse and true repentance, so then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. 
G. Campbell Morgan said this is the shortest and most accurate autobiography. <laughs> right here. Uh, indeed, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Very honest, straight to the point. He has. But is this just remorse or is he genuinely repenting? I think it's the former. And so think about some other people in Scripture uh, that were pretty, they were remorseful, but they were unrepentant. We'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. But, you know, another thing it makes me think about, too, is, uh, is those that come before us with remorse. How do we deal with that? When it's just remorse, 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 but then you don't see true repentance. You know, that can be a very frustrating thing. And it's very hard then to trust that individual. So something to think about. I, you know, a couple of these things we could talk about during our discussion period. Um, but I know, you know, personally, if someone comes to me and they're remorseful and they sound, they sound apologetic, but then a little while later it's the same thing and they're remorseful again, eventually you just lose trust. And that's a hard thing to ever gain back. And so it's a, that's a difficult thing. So and David, verse 22, answered and said, Here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. <laughs> you know, that'd be kind of funny to watch. You know, David's got his spear. You know, Saul, he's given another one of these re, uh, remorseful speeches here. And, um, and then he has to look and see that David has his spear and his water jug. And you got to wonder what was going through his mind when he saw that. So he says in verse 23, May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered you into my hand today. But I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be, val be, be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. You have to wonder... If David thought that he could help Saul change too, you know, you got to wonder if he if he he saw maybe a glimmer of hope that he could help him turn. You know, from his really his wicked ways. So he said, and then it goes on to say, then Saul said to David, "May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things." and also still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. So again, nice speech, but you have to wonder about, well, we don't have to wonder because we can read the rest of the story, but David's in the middle of it, and he's got to be wondering, is this genuine? You know, so that's just another thing to think about, too. We read this. We, we know the end from the beginning as far as Scripture goes. David's in the middle of it. And a lot of times we find ourselves in the middle of the story. God's sovereign. He knows the end from the beginning. He looks down and he's outside of time. And he knows what's going to transpire. But we don't. So we need to have that trust and lean upon the Lord. Now, Psalm 54. In your Bible, turn over to Psalm 54. Again, this is getting into the heart and the mind of David and going through this situation in Psalm 54 where it says, save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Again, we see this, again, he's in the middle of the story. He has a dependence upon the Lord, asking God, again, save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me. These are the Ziphites. All right, they've risen up against them. Strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. You know, this is the prayer of David before the Lord in this situation. But you know, you can go through Scripture, and if you, you're going through a difficult time, and you don't know how to pray, pray through this psalm. 
you know, use, use these words and apply it to your own life and your own situation, you know, to help guide and direct us in our, in our prayers. I think sometimes when we pray, we pray scripture, it's, it's actually, um, it's quite effective as far as what it does in our own hearts, you know, in the process of praying. So, so chapter 27, chapter 27. Now this is interesting. Now, in this, we, again, we see a victory of, of David. He's able to sneak into, ca- into the camp, take the sword and the, and the water jug. Should be a faith builder, right? Remember before, David had a similar situation like that. God was working. He'd see, he could see him working. And then he had this momentary lapse of faith. We're seeing it repeated here, chapter 27. And it's a reminder to us that even the best men are men at best. You know, we all still, no matter how great you are, we still have a propensity to, to fall. You know, and it, you know, this kind of reminds me of, you know, in Galatians in chapter 5, and Paul is, like we just read on Sunday, he's, he's pointing out um, the, basically the fruit of the flesh in our lives and then the fruit of the Spirit, contrasting the two. And now his point at the end of that is, is that if we live, willfully live, intentionally live in the flesh, it's indicative that of, of people that are not truly saved. If we continue on in our sin willfully, he says it. It's very similar to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. He says, if you're doing these things continu- continually and willfully, you're not a believer. It sounds harsh. But that's what it says. It also talks about er, that er, earlier in the chapter about falling from grace. Now, falling from grace is the result of not trusting in the grace of God through Jesus Christ and rather, rather trusting in our own works or our self-righteousness. And so in, in so doing, in that, we've fallen from grace if we do that, if we're trusting in our own uh, self-righteousness. Um, but here, you know, we're seeing David. He's a man after God's own heart. He falls. He has a momentary lapse of faith, but that doesn't mean he will continue to walk in that lapse. And so there's the distinction there. And so, you know, some of these words we read uh, should be sobering and call us to examine our hearts. I think that's why in chapter 6, after what Paul said in chapter 5, he, in, in, back in Galatians, he is telling us to examine our hearts. Are we trusting in our own self-righteousness, our works, and, and, and as such have fallen from grace? Are we walking willfully in sin, you know, heeding to the, to the flesh, which is indicative of a unregenerate heart? Examine our hearts before the Lord. I think this is why Paul in 2 Timothy, he made the comment about, you know, false teachers telling people what their itching ears want to hear. They want to hear you tell them, oh, no, it's okay. It's fine. It's all going to work out. No, it might not. (laughs) Examine your hearts before the Lord. Are you in the faith? Are you trusting in Christ? You know, I was talking with somebody on the phone yesterday, and and, um, we were talking about some of this stuff, and she says many people in the church today today have a just-in-case-it's-true faith. They go to church, they may do the right things and say the right things, but in their heart, they're not really surrendered to the Lord. They have a, an attitude of, well, just in case this is true, faith. That's a dead faith. We don't want to be dead, lukewarm. And by saying lukewarm, Jesus was making the point that we're actually useless in his hands. We don't want to be dead, lukewarm Christians. I don't. (laughs) I want to be on fire. I want to be full of life, full of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to carry out whatever God puts before me. You know, and that should be the attitude of everyone who calls themselves a Christian is to want, to desire whatever God has for us. You know, the, the, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit and I started off today, we're singing that song, Let Your Glory Fall in This Room. That's, that's the fruit of what God's been putting on my heart lately. 
I think we can tend to shy away from the Holy Spirit because some churches are weird, <laughs> you know, and, and they, they get into stuff that's extra biblical. It's not in the, it's not in the Bible. But we don't want the pendulum swing to, to, to swing completely over to the other side where we want, we basically just give homage to the Holy Spirit, but we don't actually ask and are, you know, filled for works of service, empowered, gifts, using those gifts for the Lord. We should be desiring these gifts that God has there for us for his purposes, for, to, to be used by, for, by him for him. And, and so this is something that's really been weighing on me lately, you know, that, that, um, that we would be a passionate band of believers. Who can stop that? The enemy can't stop that. Because our power is connected to the Lord, the Holy Spirit. It's not in the flesh. We can get angry all we want. You know, angry at the world, the things that are going on in the world, wars, rumors of wars, injustices. We see them all the time, lying media. We can get mad at that and it'll avail nothing. We need to have a righteous indignation that can only be quelled or directed by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I would ask that we all just be in pray prayer for that, that God would lay that upon our hearts. So chapter 27, and David said in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. Look at that. He's just experienced this deliverance. He's had it over and over again sovereignly by the Lord, and now he's having this momentary lapse of faith. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. You know what's interesting? In this chapter here, chapter 27, there's no mention of God in this chapter. So David is being pragmatic, you know, like his buddies were before. Yeah, kill him. Prag pragmatism. Now David's being pragmatic. Remember the last time? Let's go back here. Where were we? Was it uh, chapter, I think, 23? The last time David had this great idea was, um, no, it's not 23. Where is it? It was tw uh, uh, 21. He flees to Gath, right? It's one of the cities in, uh, of the Philistines. And um, they were coming down upon him. You know, they found out who he was. They knew the song. It was in the top 40 hits back then, I guess, you know. Saul killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands, and everybody knew it. So they knew who David was. They were finding him out. So then he, he put on this act like he was crazy. And, and as such, he was able to escape. But now, and again, that, he ended up there because of a momentary lapse of faith. Now he's having another momentary lapse of faith and he finds his, his desires to go back to the Philistines thinking if he embeds himself in the camp of the enemy, Saul is not going to come after him. All right? So again, pragmatism. So then verse 2, Then David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish the son of Moak, king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David and his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David told, and it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. So pragmatically speaking, David knew this would be the result, but this was not God's will that for him to hide embedded within the enemy, he was trusting in human logic and ingenuity rather than the guidance of the Lord. Great principle for us to remember there, especially with regard to church. So then, David said to Achish, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there, for why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. So if you look on the map there on the western side, kind of southwest, you see Ziklag. And to the west you see Gaza, Ashtalon, and Ashdad. And then to the southeast of that you see Gath. And then further southeast you see Eglon. 
those five cities to the northwest, the north, and the east, those were the main cities of the Philistines. Ziklag was kind of on the border. It was kind of a, an outpost. And so that was a place I believe that David thought that he could be safe from Saul, but then also he could have some anonymity um, from the, the, the Philistines. And so therefore Ziklag had belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David, dwell, David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and Gezerites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and, and the apparel, and, re, and returned and came to Achish. And so David, I guess he's thinking of the future. He, you know, remember when they first came into the land, God called them to wipe these peoples out. They didn't. And David's actually taking care of some of what was not done before, um, protecting the Israelites. And so we read on. So again, whenever David would go on, he would take, he would take everyone out. Then, verse 10, Achish would say, where have you made raid today? Made a raid today. That's an interesting statement. And I usually ask Aaron, you know, when she comes home, uh, how was school today? David comes home, so who have you raided today? So, you know, it gives you an idea of the norms of society and the culture in that day. That was, that was not too, such an outlandish thing to say. And David would say against the southern area of Judah or against the southern area of the Jeremielites or against the southern area of the Kenites. So David is being uh, not exactly honest here. Now it says the area of, of Judah, southern area of Judah and against the southern area, area of the Jeremielites. These were people groups that were in that territory, but he's including them in that so that um, Achish thinks he was actually taking some of them out when he was not doing that because they intermingled with the, uh, the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. And so there was an element of truth, but it was also kind of a half-truth. He's lying, basically, again. Remember the last time he got in this situation, David was lying. He kind of lied himself through different things. And, and when you're not obedient to the Lord, it, it does kind of um, snowball. You know, the lack of obedience to the Lord, that is a sin. But then one sin will beget another sin, you know, in order to cover your bases. And that's what's going on here. So he's being disingenuous with uh, Achish here. So verse 11, David, David would neither say, sorry, start again. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. So that's the reason he wiped everybody out, that there would be no witnesses, you know, to be able to dime him out as to what really happened there. So, uh, so verse, uh, where was it? Thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. And I heard that. I, um, I thought that sounded very familiar. It sounds like, sounds like Satan. You know, he creates snares, entices people, uh, creates a false sense of security with the goal that they'll be his servant forever. But you don't have to be a servant forever. You know, you can turn. We can turn and look upon the cross of Christ in faith and be delivered. You know, sometimes Satan will entice people in a lot of different ways and a lot of different sins, and some of those sins become besetting sins, sins that people will continue to struggle with. And he'll bait them in, he'll entice them, he'll, he'll tempt them. And it can be anything. It can be alcohol abuse, it can be substance abuse, it can be um, you know, sexual sin, it can be pornography, whatever it is. All these snares that the enemy can set and, um, and us as fallible human beings 
who sometimes have momentary lapses of faith succumb to the flesh and give in, and sometimes those sins can explode. And then in the mind of Satan, he thinks, ah, I've got someone, all right? They'll be my servant forever. But we have an advocate with the Father, all right? Jesus Christ. And so anyone at any time can turn from their sin and put their trust and faith in Christ in real repentance, not remorse, but repentance. Remorse is okay, by the way. Before real repentance can happen, there should be remorse. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why are they blessed? Because they're poor in spirit. because they're acknowledging their sin. But the next step is to, to acknowledge your sin before a holy God. The next, the next step is to then turn from that and put our trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, again, I've said this before. I, I'll say this again because it has to be said. The distinction between justificational repentance and sanctificational repentance. We, in justificational repentance, we are convicted of our sin and we recognize that we can't uh, earn favor with God through our good works. Can't do it. Nobody can. As we've been studying Galatians, you know, we look at the law and the law tells us that we've all fallen short. So our recourse isn't to just try to be a better person. If you think that, you will be mired in that and strive your whole life and you'll never attain to a level that's acceptable to God. And you'll constantly be frustrated and you'll never have that peace. That's what the Judaizers were trying to get these, these Galatians to do. We're not called to repent justificationally of every sin that we've ever committed. We're called to turn from, from the solution that we think is works and turn and put our trust in Christ and what he's accomplished on the cross. That's justificational repentance. Now we've been justified. We can stand before a holy God. And as it says in 1 John 4, 18, we can stand boldly before the throne without fear because perfect love, Jesus Christ, drives out all fear. And so we have, again, we have the advocate with the Father. We go before the Lord. Yes, I've sinned. There's nothing I can do. I've got nothing except to put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's justificational repentance, right? We're justified. We're positionally righteous. Everything that happens after that, that's when we repent from our sin, from the sin, the, the everyday sins. The first sin, justificational repentance, was the sin of self-righteousness. Sanctificational repentance is every day. We wake up, momentary lapse of faith. We do something stupid. We sin. We don't trust the Lord. You know, we compromise. We, we trust more in pragmatism rather than trusting in the Lord. And, and in so doing, we sin. And perhaps that sin lent, then leads to other sins and other sins. Here we find ourselves at the end of the day. Oh, I'm not right. My heart is not right. We turn from that and we go before the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. That's sanctificational repentance. You didn't lose your salvation because you sinned. If you think you can lose your salvation because you sin, sinned, you didn't really attain your salvation through grace, which is what Paul was, the point he was making. You've fallen from grace if you believe in that. And anybody who thinks that they can attain uh, acceptance with God through their good works has no clue of what a sinner they really are. Oh, yeah, I'm basically a good person. No, you're not. <laughs> you're a dirty, rotten wretch. You know, now I, you know, some people tell this to me sometimes, you know, they're like, I like to hear your testimony because you have a good testimony. You, you, you were just a complete loser scumbag and you came to the Lord. Praise the Lord, right? But the reality is we all are in comparison to the holiness of God, you know, so I crack up sometimes, you, you, you know, the, we, we tend to, as the church, we tend to have this kind of attitude as we need to share the gospel with the down and out. You know, we need to share the gospel with them because they're down and out, you know. And then the guy, you know, down at the other end of town, he's got it all together. He's got a great job, makes lots of money, is really happy, has got a great, beautiful wife, beautiful kids. Kids are going to Ivy Leagues. Everything is just splendid. That guy needs the gospel just as much as the down and out guy over here. Because as we all stand before God, we stand on equal footing, and that equal footing is in the mud of sin. We have no hope. 
And so, you know, I think, the, I think we really, really need as the church to meditate upon these truths, to understand that because there's like a wave of um, anti-Christian or false teaching propaganda that, you know, comes into, slips into the church. And, and then we start to almost sort of kind of believe it when we hear it enough. Even, was it, was it Hitler who said, didn't think you're going to come here tonight and hear a quote from Hitler. But anyway, so, you know, if you hear a lie enough times, eventually you're going to believe it. And, man, you see this over and over again. People are so easily swayed and brainwashed. You know, you can look at the whole issue of climate change and how that's just been repeated over and over and over and over and over again. And people don't think, they don't actually look at evidence, they just hear that over and over and over again, and they just, then they begin to parrot it. And then the people that they parrot it to, they hear it over and over and over again, and they begin to parrot it. Anyway, point being is that we hear these lies, right, and then we actually start to take them in and believe it. And um, that's why we have to get, we have to cling to the, to the Lord and cling to his word so that we don't succumb to the lies. And so, finally, just kind of wrapping up here. Again, he said, he has made his people utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever. Now, we know he will not be his servant forever because David will turn from that situation. And again, it's a reminder to us. David had a momentary lapse of faith, and he got himself into this situation. It can happen to all of us, but that doesn't mean we've been separated from God. All right, we can sin, we can fall short. doesn't mean God's cut us off. No, we've been saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus saved us. His, his sacrificial, atoning sacrifice on the cross saved us. All we're called to do is look upon it in faith. And so we have to remember that. So Because the enemy will try to come in. Why, why do we hear this stuff repeated over and over again by Paul in the New Testament? Because Satan creeps into the hearts and the minds of people you know, and he spins his little web and, and shoots his, you know, uh, fiery darts of doubt and false teaching into our minds, and we start to buy into it. And so that's why we have to be con continually in God's word, reminding ourselves of truth, that there even is such a thing of, as truth, and to rest in the goodness of God. And that goodness of God, again, has been extended to us through Jesus Christ who paid it all for each and every one of us. Greatest news in the world. So with that, let's, we'll stop there. Next week, we pick up in chapter 28. Very interesting story there. It's where Saul, he consults a medium. So I'll talk about going off the rails, you know. So uh, scripture's very clear. We're not to do things like that. Yet here now we've seen David momentary lapse of, of faith. Saul's been kind of riding that train for a while, uh, and now we're going to see how he's, he becomes extremely fearful, and, and, and in his fear, he actually, it actually enables him to go into sin, but I'll so no, say no more. We'll get into that next week. So, Lord, again, we are thankful for our time together and your word and, the, and these principles that we're able to glean from it, and Lord, we just pray that you'd help us. Lord, help us, and um, when we have momentary lapses of faith, help us, Lord, to turn from that, to get our eyes back on you, to trust you, even though what you're calling us to do might be a little bit frightening. Help us to be obedient anyway and, um, and go along with, with your will rather than ours. We acknowledge, Lord, that we can only do that through, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, so we ask that you would just pour out your spirit upon us. Pray for all those that are listening online. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon them. Help us as a church to have that power to carry out the Great Commission to, with boldness and with an attitude of love and mercy and grace. And may it all be for your honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.